But what if I change the wording and I ask, which one of you are disciples of Christ? It's a little different, isn't it? But actually, in essence, it's the same thing. Are we disciples of Jesus Christ? Or are we simply namesake Christians? And I ask you, especially in your meditation for this weekend, I think you all hate me for the past year and a half because I gave you assignments every time I spoke. But when you go home before Sunday, I want you to read the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7. Two chapters. Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7. Just two chapters. And in these two chapters, very often it's seen in chapter 5, verses 3 to 12, it's seen as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord ascends the Mount, He sits and He begins preaching. He begins preaching and dictating certain things to these newly called disciples. But actually in these two chapters, this entire beautiful sermon, the Lord tells us what is needed from us to be true disciples of Him. And there is one particular thing that's very important for our meditation. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, as soon as I'm able to find it in my notes, or chapter 4 rather, verse 18 to 20, it says, the Apostle Matthew writes, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Actually, in the Greek, it's a mistranslation. The disciples never left. The real word for left is really abandoned. The disciples abandoned everything. They abandoned their families. They abandoned their jobs. They abandoned, they abandoned everything they do for one cause. Not their own cause, but for the cause of Christ. And there are many, many of us who sit here and we say one particular thing. We have many Christians that say that I know God will be there for me when I need Him. I have news. That is not a Christian concept. That is not a Christian at all. That is a belief that is a backward belief most of all. It is saying that God is there to help my cause. But Christ in this particular gospel passage, Christ is calling man to participate in his cause. Christians are those who have made a promise and call to a personal answer the call to a personal discipleship. And we as disciples or as Christians have decided to co-labor and work with Christ in the saving of the world. And when we look at the life of St. Gregorios, we see this great thing he abandons. Are we willing to abandon? Because it's not enough that we look at the life of St. Gregorius and say, oh, my mother may intercede that I get this and that. No. It's also that we look at the life of this saint and emulate his life. A life that went to abandoning the ways of this world. Abandoning the ways of this world and living only for one cause. Just think, we all know, especially children, when you go to this island and that that's a sacred place. It's a beautiful place now. But when we hear about the different stories that go on in the life of this great saint, we hear all these different miracles. But the greatest miracle of all, never over again. <laughs> Thank you. But the greatest miracle of all is that a man, and he was a rather young person too, he said yes to the call of Christ and abandoned everything for Him. In our own relationship as husbands, as wives, as parents, you have a cause that's been entrusted to you. God has given you the cause. And they're right next to you. They're probably in front of you. They're behind you. How are you living that cause? Are you adhering to that cause with dedication? 
or with falsehood. Because that's the problem today. Many of us, we have a great smog of witness. Not a cloud of witness, a smog of witness. We fool ourselves. We fool ourselves and we look at all these different things that the church gives to us and we say we don't need it. There's a story written by Father Anthony Camieras. He's a Greek, a Greek Orthodox priest in Minneapolis, actually. And there's a story that he records in one of his books. He writes, there's a story of a little girl. And this little girl, he sees his, she sees her mother in the morning, at breakfast time, and looks at the mother and says, Mom, you know, I love you. You're beautiful, you're great. But you know, you have beautiful you nose, know, you have a beautiful nose, beautiful eyes, beautiful cheeks, beautiful hair. But your arms, they're ugly. Your arms are really ugly, Mom. Then the mother replied to her daughter and said, Well, dear, my name is little girl, is about seven or eight. Well, when, when you were really young, there was a big fire that broke out when you were napping upstairs in your bedroom. So what happened was mommy ran all the way upstairs, and as the fire was coming close to your grip, mommy grabbed you. And when in the process of grabbing you, this fire hit mommy's arms, and that's why mommy has all these marks. The daughter looked at the mother and said, Mom, your hair is beautiful, your eyes are beautiful, your nose is beautiful, but the most beautiful thing about you are your arms. This is exactly the life of the church. The church is trying to protect us and trying to transform us with every little thing by fasting and by praying. And the beautiful image of this who offers us to us especially is our patron Saint Saint Gregorius. But many of us, we see this and we see it's ugly. It's something we do not want to do. It's something we reject. The reason why we reject it is because of something called pride. It's because of pride. See, there's another story. I'm going to give you a lot of stories. There's a story of a... You've heard of the story of the ugly duckling? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? It's a modified version. This ugly duckling is in this group of all these other little ducks. And this duckling is wild, swimming around, and it feels really awkward. It says, you know, I look so weird, I look so different. There's something awkward about me. All these other ducks are different. Look at me, I look really awkward. I have these different marks from them. Eventually, this little ugly duckling eventually realizes this duckling, that he or she, is not a duck. Eventually, this ugly duckling grows into a beautiful swan. And once it grows into a beautiful swan, it looks at itself and says, wow, I'm beautiful. And realizes the only, the, the greatest thing about her is that her identity, he or she realizes her identity that she is a, not a duckling, but rather a swan. She didn't see herself as ugly anymore. She knew who she was. That is this identity crisis that we all are having. We still think in the midst of this world, we're thinking there were ugly ducklings. But when really you're beautiful swans. The idea of this great feast, and especially of this transformation that we're called to do, that we're called to be part of, in this life of the church, and especially when we gather this weekend, is for all of us to sit and wonder and to reflect. As we begin to prepare, we look at this great image of a saint. Are we really willing to leave and abandon certain things in our lives and live for the cause of Christ? Or are we going to remain stuck in our own ways? There's a book called The Greatest of All Sciences is to Know Oneself. And especially you young people, before you go to college or if you're in college or you're past college, get it. Because there's a lot this book can teach you. It has different stories that offers you about the life of holiness, how you can transform yourself. And it says here, there's a story of how we should balance ourselves and how we should see ourselves. It's a story of an elderly priest, a boy scout, and a science professor. They were the only passengers on a small plane. As they were flying, the engine began making strange noises. The pilot, he left the controls and told the passengers, 
This plane is going down. We only have three parachutes, and there are four of us. I must have a parachute because I have a wife and small children who need me. So the pilot, he grabbed the packet, he strapped it to his back, back and jumped. That left to three people with only two parachutes. Then the science professor, he leaped to his feet and said, I absolutely must have a parachute. I am the smartest man in the world. My work benefits the whole human race. Humanity needs me. So the scientist, he grabbed a packet, <clears throat> he strapped it to his back and jumped. That left the elderly preacher, this priest, and the boy scout. This old Achen looked at the boy and said, You know, I'm not eager to die. I have had a full life, and I'm really ready to meet my God. You, you are young. I want you to go on living. Here, you take this last parachute, and I'll go down with the plane. This young boy scout replied, Relax, father. We still have two parachutes left. The smartest man in the world just jumped out with, uh, with my backpack. <laughs> Many of us joke around, but we don't like people who think too highly of themselves, especially ones who brag that he is the smartest person in the world. It has been said, pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. If this feast means anything, and I'm not going to elaborate, it's 8.30 and I know tomorrow we have to wake up for Holy Kurbana. But with these different stories and thoughts and meditations that are offered from the Gospel, these are questions that are knocking at the door of your heart. Are you willing to change like the life of St. Gregorius? And I leave you with this very last image, it's not a story, it's truth. In the sacrament of Holy Baptism, there was something that I always wondered. In the sacrament of holy baptism, one of the first things that happens is that the child, he denies who? Satan and says yes to Jesus, right? He says yes to God. Have you ever wondered why? Why it's, that, it's in that particular order? Why not the child or does God ever say yes to Jesus first, then say no to Satan? There is a particular reason that the Father is talking about. The reason being, in order to say yes to holiness, we have to say no to Satan first. In order to say yes to Christ, we first have to say no to Satan. And especially in our lives, especially as we gather this weekend for this great feast, this threefold feast, who are you saying yes to and who are you saying no to? St. Gregorius was one person who said no to Satan 24-7. He was known for that. He's the idol of saying no to Satan. And it's because of his prayers and his no, his stern and steady no, that he was able to drive out Satan from that island, but most of all become an icon of holiness who said that no to Satan and yes to Jesus. What about you? You have that chance to. You and I have that chance to say yes to Christ. But are you willing to say no to Satan first? Because remember, keeping this pride in our heart, that's a way of saying yes to Satan. And that is what prevents us from observing and receiving the full blessing and fruit of this great feast. If we're unwilling to leave our pride and our ego at the door, this bedal is meaningless. You might as well stay at home. But if you want to leave at the door and live a life, ascending to the heights of Christ where he's seated in the right hand of God the Father, and the one who showed us that very way how to do it through the life of St. Gregorius, then come. Come. Come, confess, receive a transformation in your life. I know perhaps on days like this, I really feel that sometimes it's not necessary to have sermons and retreats and things of that sort. Because if we listen to the prayers and the life of the church, what it's saying to us about the great saint, it gives us the message already.
Come, follow me. Are you ready to leave everything? Are you ready to leave and abandon everything? Especially your pride. And come, follow me. The one who will grant you salvation and eternal life. To the glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God forever and ever on Yeah. Uh -huh.
Precious Lord,